As I said last week, it's important to have the right perspective. Remember the story of the three workers at St. Paul's Cathedral in in London? Uh, These three men who were working on the project were were interviewed by an interviewer, a newspaper man, and and they had very, very different perspectives. The first couldn't uh, get a see past uh, what he was doing. When he was asked, what is he doing? Well, this stonemason said, well, can't you see I'm I'm putting a a, a rock in its place in the the wall? He couldn't see past his little involvement in where he was. The second man we remember from last week was only concerned about the money received. And he said, well, can't you see I'm just earning a salary? And and then the third man was interviewed when asked, what are you doing on this building project? Uh, He replied, I'm I'm building this cathedral to the glory of God. This man had had a vision, a a perspective, a a vista of of the glory of God. And friends, I hope that as we continue the second part in the sermon, that you have a perspective of the glory of God and what God is doing in in people's lives around you, you and of course in, in your life. Imagine you were living when uh, Michelangelo, the, the great painter and sculptor, was painting the, the famous Sistine Chapel. And uh, you, you, you say to him, he, he, says, to, uh, he says to you, um, won't you finish off the, the task that I've begun? Won't you, won't you finish the, the, the face um, that uh, I've been painting? Well, I know that if you asked me, I wouldn't dare to touch that face because I'd, I'd simply adulterate that famous uh, painting. Imagine a, a famous sculptor or a, a, a painter came to you and said, look, I've, I've finished everything on, the, on this portrait. Won't you just complete the eyes of, on this face? Wouldn't you just finish them for me? I'm sure that like you, like me, you wouldn't want to adulterate or spoil a master. And, and, and certainly, that's a, a, a really um, a, a sobering thought as we think about that story. If you think it'll be shocking to uh, uh, finish off a, a Michelangelo or a, a Rembrandt or a, a Picasso, imagine what it is to, to finish the mission that Jesus has begun. Certainly a, a sobering thought that God has called us to finish his unfinished mission. Now, we saw last week that um, Jesus has completed the work of redemption. His work on the cross is a, is a finished work. We, we know that. But when it comes to his mission, Jesus, what is the word? He's only begun. Jesus is only uh, begun. And Uh, Certainly, when we look at Acts chapter 1 and verse 1, did you ever realize that Jesus began a mission, but that Jesus has an unfinished mission? Acts chapter 1 and verse 1, uh, uh, Luke writes, I'm reading from the NIV, in my former book, Theophilus, and Luke is uh, recording uh, remember, he's referring to the, the first part of his book, Luke, the Gospel of Luke, um, and the, the Greek word there that is used is uh, the, the first part of a two-part narrative. And Luke writes there, I wrote of all that Jesus, what's the word? Jesus began. Now, it's interesting that we talk so much about the finished work of Christ when we face the the very reality that Jesus only began something. He began to do and to teach, and the rest of the book of Acts uh, tells a story, and may I use that word in part, tells a story in part, and and that story is continuing to today, Um, and of course that mission will only be finished when Jesus comes again. When Jesus Christ comes, that mission is is finished, um, and, and we're in the, the process of finishing the mission that, that Christ has begun. Now, 
Last week, we began looking at the essential ingredients that we need for, for finishing that, that mission. So let's turn to Acts chapter 1, and we'll start reading from verse 1. Acts chapter 1, and we're going to read from verse 1. In the first book of Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the, the day that he was uh, uh, taken up. After, after he, had, he had given commands through the Holy Spirit and to the apostles whom he had chosen, he presented himself alive to them after, suffer, after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You have heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and the cloud took him out of their sight. Verse 10, And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes, and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. So far we'll read uh, in God's word. We're looking, we continue to look at finishing the unfinished mission of Jesus. To finish the unfinished mission of Jesus, firstly, we, we saw you, you need a particular uh, a message. In verse 1 to 3, we saw that right through his uh, ministry, uh, Jesus taught his disciples but before the, uh, uh, the, his death on the cross and, and after his resurrection, he taught them again and again. Jesus wanted to do, make, fin uh, make sure that the, the, the disciples understood the particular message. Now, one of my great concerns is that Christians don't know the, the content of the gospel, the, the message of, of Jesus Christ. They, they don't understand the, 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 the content of what Jesus taught. Hosea chapter 4 and verse 6 says, My people are destroyed because of a lack of knowledge. Why is the church struggling to finish that unfinished mission of Jesus? Well, I believe in part that it's because Christians cannot share or don't understand or, or don't know the, the, the particular message that, that Jesus taught. You cannot finish the mission of Christ unless you know the, the content of the message. It is absolutely essential that we understand the particular message. Now, uh, that, that's the first point we, we looked at. If we're going to finish the unfinished mission of Jesus, we, we need a particular message. And then we saw last week as well, number two, if you're going to finish that unfinished mission of Jesus, you need a, a personal reality of, of Jesus Christ in your life. Last time we saw that it's not enough just to, to know that particular message. Information isn't enough. The apostles needed a, a, a personal reality of Jesus. Jesus appeared to these men and women um, after his resurrection on, on numerous occasions, and there would be no doubt, absolutely no doubt in their minds that Jesus was alive. These men and women were absolutely convinced about the fact that, that Jesus has, had ridden, risen from the dead. Now, remember the story about doubting Thomas? Uh, we read about that uh, in the Gospels. Well, doubting Thomas, and I enjoyed this, doubting Thomas became determined Thomas, a man that God was going to use in a powerful way. In fact, he was so determined that this man was eventually martyred for his faith. 
He was so certain about the resurrected Lord Jesus. And then there was Jesus' brothers. Remember, they, they didn't believe he was the Messiah. And James, one of Jesus' brothers, became the, the leader of the Jerusalem church. As we look on, we, we see there was a conviction about the living Lord Jesus Christ. The question for us today is, is the, the living Jesus a, a reality in your life? Is Jesus real to you? That's a question we all need to ask. And I want to say this morning, if, if Jesus is not real to you, you're going to struggle spiritually. And I say to you, people of God, you cannot finish the unfinished mission of Jesus unless it flows out of a, a vital reality of, of Christ in your personal life. Unless you, you're seeing and feeling and, and knowing and fellowshipping and, and sharing with Jesus. You see, you cannot be a, a second-hand witness. You can't give somebody else's testimony. What is, what is so powerful about Helen's testimony this morning is, is that it's her story. It's her story about what the living Lord Jesus has, has done in, in her life. You cannot be a second-hand witness. You can't pass on a, a scripture that's totally irrelevant to you because you've never, ever met the, the living Lord Jesus. Some years ago, a, a person came to me and he, he said, Pastor, I just can't cut this. I can't share my faith. I'm, I'm battling spiritually. And so the first thing I asked him is, is are you having a quiet time? Are you fellowshipping with the, the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, I'm sure you've guessed it. The, the answer was no. Jesus wasn't real to him. We cannot continue the unfinished mission or finish the unfinished mission of Christ unless it comes from a, a personal relationship with, with Jesus Christ. We're going to continue. That was what we went up to last week. Uh, we're going to continue the number three. If you are to finish the unfinished mission of Jesus Christ, you, you need a, a powerful renewal of the Holy Spirit in your life. Verse 4, And while they were staying with him, he, that is Jesus, ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. Do you know that when they got together, Jesus commanded them not to, to leave Jerusalem? You've got the particular message, I've taught you for three years. You've got the, the personal reality, you know I'm alive. But you know there was one thing missing in their lives. What is it? What did Jesus say? There was one word. That one word was, wait. Wait. What were they waiting for? They were, they were waiting for the gift that the, the Father had, had promised. What Jesus was, was saying to these disciples is, is don't fire out on your, on your own strength. Don't blast off in your, your own energy. That would be like me taking my own chisel, taking my own paintbrush, taking over that face of, of Michelangelo, and, and I'd mess it up completely. The Lord says, don't go anywhere, just wait for the promise of the Father. Well, what is the promise of the Father? Uh, Luke 11 and verse 13 tells us, If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give you, what is it? Give the Holy Spirit to, to those who ask him. Now, the Holy Spirit couldn't be sent or given until Jesus had gone back into heaven. Don't go anywhere until the Holy Spirit comes. Verse 5 in our reading, Acts chapter 1. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And here we see that Jesus introduces this concept of the, the baptism of the Spirit. The Apostle Paul later uh, explains 
This baptism of the Holy Spirit, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and, and, and verse 13. For we were all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether it be Jews or Greeks, bond or free, and we have all been made to drink into one spirit. What Paul is saying is that, that everybody, if, if they've accepted Christ, would receive, would be baptized in the Spirit. Every Christian, whether rich or poor or, or famous or, or not famous, doesn't matter who you are, if you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You are baptized at conversion. Then in verse 8, then you'll receive, what's the word? You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. That's very interesting. The, the Greek uh, is, is a passive. In other words, you shall be baptized. It will be done to you. You don't earn it. You, you don't deserve it. You, you can't work it up. You just get it from God. And, and, and what's the result? What happens? Well, there's power. When the Holy Spirit comes on, on the followers of Jesus, the most unlikely people become fountains of, of power. Ordinary people begin doing extraordinary things for God. And I know if you have been a Christian for a while, you, you just see the most unlikely people. that They share their faith and, and people get saved. I'll never forget when I was 13 years old and, and I was very shy, believe it or not. And God enabled me to, to share my faith. I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit later at a holiday club and, and, and children got saved. Now it's like Michelangelo and he comes to me and he, and he says to me, Witta, I, I want you to finish this masterpiece, but I'm, I'm going to hold both your hands. Now that's totally different. Wow. You know, I can only uh, draw stick men if I'm lucky. The hands of the, ma the master hold mine while he, he does his work. I've been part of it, but the master has directed it. That's exactly what God is saying here, what Christ was saying to his disciples. I want you to, to finish my work. I'll give you the tools you need. And just make it possible, I'm, I'm, I'm going to put my Holy Spirit inside of you and I will do the work through you. If only, listen carefully, if only you will yield to me. You see, there's only one way to get Jesus' work done and that is with his power. We have the particular message, the word of God. We have the, the personal reality of, of Christ in our, in our lives. We know that Jesus has, has risen from the dead and he lives today. We have this powerful renewal. Jesus has, has given us his Holy Spirit. And, and, and God releases his, his power through the Spirit. And in the words of Ephesians chapter 3, and he can do exceedingly, abundantly, more than we think or ask. Right? Amen. Somebody's awake this morning. Hallelujah. God can do far more through, through your life and through Helen's life and through Marlene's life and through Graham's life than you can even think or imagine. Friends, we, we need to seek this empowering of the Spirit, this filling of the Holy Spirit. And, and as you, you journey through the book of Acts, you, you see this time and time again. Chapter 4, verse 8, it tells us, Then Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit and, and began to speak. In chapter 4, verse 31, they were filled, the disciples were, were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to, to speak the word. Who knows what the word is? Boldly. Have, have, have you suffered from a, a lack of boldness? I want to say to you, what you need is the filling of God's Spirit in your life. 
chapter 6 and verse 3, choose men from among you. What is the, the qualification? People who are full of the Spirit. In Acts chapter 9 and verse 17, Ananias prays for Saul, who would become the apostle Paul. What does he pray for? To be filled with the Spirit. Acts 13 verse 9, Then Saul, who was also called Paul, was filled with the Holy Spirit. Acts 13 verse 52, And the disciples... We're filled with joy and the Holy Spirit. You know, if I saw people getting saved and, and baptized, becoming part of God's church, I'd also be filled with joy. Friends, we, we need to seek the fullness of God's Spirit. It may be unbelievable now, and it probably is if our thought about this 20, 30 years ago, but when I was a teenager and a young man, even up to the age of 30, I was incredibly shy. And I wrote that, 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 that incredibly shy in big letters on my script when I prepared this sermon. When I went to college, two out of the three referees, they said that Paul speaks very, very fast. I've slowed down tremendously, believe me. I only go on a motorbike at 120 now. But I want to tell the story because how many of us are, are scared to, to share our faith? We, we're terrified and we wonder what's going to happen. When I was 13 years old and I, I got involved in our church holiday club, I remember praying as a, as a 13 year old God, use me. Although I'm shy and although I speak fast when I'm, when I'm nervous, won't you use me? Do you know that God answered that prayer and right at the end of the Holy Club, God had used me to, to, to lead five children to faith in, in the Lord Jesus Christ. As you work through the, the book of Acts, and I'd, I'd encourage you to, 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 to do that, to work, read through it. You meet ordinary people Filled and empowered by the Spirit of God. Powerful, personal renewal of the Holy Spirit. Friends, pray for it and pray for it and pray for it. Of the initial baptism of the Spirit at Pentecost, we see these disciples were, were filled and, and filled uh, again and again. Today we look back to Pentecost. And we look forward and expect the, the filling of the Spirit again and again. It's like a cup that is filled again and again. And, and as it overflows, we, we touch people around us. Isn't that beautiful? That's what the Holy Spirit can, can do in, in your life. Powerful renewal. Number four, if you are to, com to complete or to finish the unfinished mission of, of Jesus Christ, you, you need a, a proper perspective. Now, people, I regularly get this question. People ask me, Pastor, do you think we're in the end time? Maybe you've asked that question. Uh, you know, is the end of the world coming? Is Jesus coming again? And of course we are. We, we've been in the end times for the last 2,000 years. 1 John says, my little children, it is the last days. And that was said 2,000 years ago. In verse 6, the disciples have a question. So when they came together, they, they asked Jesus, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And that wasn't a good question because that was not Jesus' plan but, but how do you think that, that Jesus answered that question? Well, verse 7 tells us, Jesus said to them, It is not for you to know the times or the season that the Father has fixed by his own authority. 
In other words, what Jesus was saying is it's actually none of your business. I like that. You know, we as Christians, we get so preoccupied with the end times that we, we lose touch to what Jesus is doing today around us. Some Christians are so preoccupied with the end times that they, they lose touch with the now. Every month they are, are reading the, the latest book that has been published about when Jesus is coming again. Or they're up on their roofs, their pajamas, looking up. Somebody's laughing. I think maybe they've done it. <laughs> but you know, that, that's what they talk about all the time. And you and I know there have been many predictions about when Jesus will come again at the end of the world. December 21, 2012 marked the end of the first great cycle of the Maya long count calendar. And, and many people predicted that this was going to be the end of the uh, world. Well, it's now 2021 and we're still here. And then there was a man by the name of Harold Camping who publicly predicted that the end of the world would come. He, he predicted not once or twice or three times or four times or five times or six times or seven times or eight times or nine times or 10 times or 11 times, 12 times. According to the Britannic, I looked it up on the, in the internet yesterday, 12 times based on biblical uh, uh, numerology. I mean, who listens to a guy like that who's predicted the, the end of the world or Jesus coming 12 times? In 1992, he, he published a book honestly titled 1994. You've guessed that he predicted the, the end of the world. Mark 13 verse 32 says the following, no one knows about that day or hour nor, not the, the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on your guard and stay alert. For you do not know when the appointed time will come. I believe there are signs which tell us that the Lord Jesus is coming. It's imminent. He can come at any time. But friends, we, we, we need the right perspective. We need the, the right focus. We need the, the right vision in front of us. And that vision, that focus, that perspective is reaching people for Jesus Christ. Friends, we've, we've got a, a job to do as, as God's people. Number five, if you are to finish the unfinished mission of Jesus Christ, you, you need a, a purposeful mandate. Verse 8. While we're waiting for Jesus to come, and as long as we've got that particular message and that personal reality of, of Jesus Christ in our lives, and we've been renewed by the Spirit of God, and we have the right perspective, what do we do? What is the Christian supposed to be doing? Verse 8, in the middle of the verse, it says the following. And you shall be my, my witnesses, both in Judea and all, uh, both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Friends, that's our mandate from, from Jesus Christ himself. The God of this universe has called you. You know that? God has given you a purpose, and God has called you and you and, and, and all of you, if you know him personally, to be a witness. That word is used no less than 39 times in the book of Acts. John 20 and verse 21 has become a, a special verse to me. As the Father has sent me, Jesus said, I am sending you. If you're a Christian this morning, then, then God is speaking into your life. Jesus says to you, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. Jesus prayed in John chapter 17 and verse 18, 
Father, as you have sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. Do you know that that Jesus has, has prayed for you that you would go into the world? What a mighty challenge for us. What a prayer to pray. And Jesus himself prayed that prayer. I know what you're thinking this morning. I don't have the gift of evangelism. Who's thought that? How many honest people here this morning? I don't have the gift of evangelist. I'm not an evangelist. Well, I've got news for you, nor am I an evangelist either. What did Jesus say in, in verse 8? You shall be my, my, witness, my witnesses. And you're quite right in that perhaps you are not called to be an evangelist. Maybe you're not an evangelist. Most of us aren't. But you know what? Jesus has called every Christian, listen carefully, Jesus has called every Christian to be a witness. He has called every Christian to share what he or she has personally seen and heard. And that's exactly what Helen did this morning. Helen, are you an evangelist? She's shaking her head, no, no, please not. Okay. (laughs) Helen is not an evangelist, but friends, Helen is a witness. You see, she she shares what she's seen and heard in her own life. She says what, what God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the Spirit of God has done in her life. That's why, people of God, we're encouraging you to do certain things, to pray, to pray. And behind me, there's a net where if you want to, you can put a name on a fish and, and put it up, a blue fish. And when that, uh, almost said the fish, when the person gets saved, we'll make it green. There's some fish here this morning. There's a basket. There should be a pen there. If you want to come up, if it's meaningful for you to, to come and to write down a person's name and, and, to, and to pray for that person. We're encouraging you to pray for, for your family men's, uh, members and your friends and people you love and caring about and, and people you work with. And then to prepare your, your personal testimony. We've got little sheets that help you to do that. We have sent them out. But friends, we, we need to be prepared to share our faith, what we have seen and heard in our own lives, what, what God has done in your life and in my life. But what is our mandate to be a witness? You know, the the Christian mandate is very simple, but we we seem to make it very, very complicated. There's an interesting story about, or a parable about a shepherd. I don't know if you've read about it. It was a shepherd who, who counted his sheep, and he discovered that a bunch were missing. He was so concerned about his missing sheep that he, he decided he needed to do something. He needed to get them back in, into the fold. And, and so he hired a, a sheepdog. And he sent out the sheepdog to find the, the missing sheep. But all he got was a, a tired dog. Sounds like a pastor. All he got was a, 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 a tired sheepdog. And then, you know, he found a, a whole lot of other shepherds who also had, had missing sheep. And they had a, a shepherd with missing sheep conference. You get the picture? They sat around and they tried to, to strategize. And then they appointed a, a subcommittee to, to study the, the missing sheep problem. Someone came up with, with neon signs, yeah, sheep, yeah. Others came up with a a bumper sticker saying, come sheep, come. And some even came up with sweatbands. You know, it's a little bit more subtle when you put it around your head. And then someone decided that it was an outstanding sheep rock group that would attract missing sheep. It's all kind of ridiculous, isn't it? Jesus was a shepherd And when he lost sheep, what did he do? 
He went out and he found them. You know, it's amazing what we can do in a committee that you could never do individually for some strange reason. You know, we, we even invent gospel blip, uh, blimps. Have you read the book Gospel Blimp? There was a guy who wanted to, 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 to uh, witness to his neighbors. So what did he do? He, he hired a blimp and then he, he dropped tracks in their backyard. What is our mandate? Well, you say to me, well, what is a witness? I don't know if you've ever been to a courtroom. I have some years ago when they stole the, the, the plaques of our church wall of remembrance. They got the copper and the guy was arrested. Mr. Witter, we'd like you to tell the court what you saw and what you heard and what you felt. That's exactly what... 1 John 1 and verse 1 says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. That is what we proclaim, Jesus Christ. Just do it. Don't decide on it. Just do it. See, you're either good, bad, or indifferent. Christ has given you the power. All you've got to do is to, to draw on that power. I remember when we were still teenagers and our, our youth pastor, some of you know him, Richard Murray, he took us around in our area and we went to blocks of flats and we knocked on the door to share Jesus Christ. Friends, just get on to that personal salvation testimony. You, you've got a, a story to tell. If, you, if you're a Christian, you, you've got a, a story to tell. Then lastly this morning, if you are to finish the unfinished work of Jesus Christ, you, you need a, a passionate expectation, verses 9 to 11. A passionate expectation. If you're like me, you, you need to get excited. You, you need to be motivated. And I think of getting motivated, I think of running or, or losing some weight. That was my lockdown motivation. I haven't got very far with that. But we all need a, a bit of motivation. You know, when it comes to motivation, people do some strange things, some crazy things in life. Just last week, I, I read a story by, uh, about a guy by the name of Larry Walters, a, a 33-year-old truck driver who was just sitting around doing nothing for week in and, and week out, doing nothing until boredom got the better of him. I don't know if you've been in that spot. You're just so bored that it drives you nuts. So he needed some ad adventure. And so on the 2nd of July, 1982, he rigged 42 helium balloons to his garden lawn chair in San Pedro, California, and he lifted off. Armed with a pellet gun in case he should fly too high and could shoot out some balloons. This really happened, by the way. Well, you're shocked because to discover that he reached... 16,000 feet, and he wasn't the only shocked one. Surprised pilots reported, and this is by Los Angeles, some guy in a, in a, law chair, a lawn chair floating in the sky to perplex traffic, air traffic control controllers. Well, finally, Walters had some sense to shoot out some of the balloons, which allowed him to safely land 45 minutes later at Long Beach, California. Thank goodness you didn't go into, into the sea. Talk about motivation. We need to change. And Christian, you and I need to have the right motivation. Mark Twain famously said, the only one who likes change, wait for this, is a wet baby. And he's probably right. 
Anyway, God knows we need to be, to be motivated. Look at verse 9. And when he said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a, a cloud took him, took Jesus out of their sight. Jesus just took off. Not with healing balloons, by the way. Verse 10. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, Behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. People, people of God, what is our motivation? What is our motivation? to share our faith, to serve Christ. Jesus is what? Jesus is coming back again. May I say that again? Jesus is coming back again. And if we're going to do something, we need to do it now. You know what 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 9 and 10 says? So we aspire to please him, whether we are here in this body or away from it. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive his due for the things done in the body, whether good or bad. Christ is coming soon, and when he comes, he says in Revelation 22, verse 12, Behold, I'm coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give it to everyone according to what he has done. Whatever you're going to do, do it quickly. You see, time is short, and, and Jesus is coming again. How many of us have waited or that parent, or maybe that, that child, or, or a friend of ours, or, or somebody we love and care about. And you know, it, it's just too late. You know, the most tragic thing is somebody we know, and, the, and they die without Christ, into a Christless eternity. When you come to the end of your life, will you be able to say, Lord, I'm, I'm ready to die because I have finished my course. You know what the apostle Paul said to Timothy, 2 Timothy 4 and verse 6, for I'm already being poured out like a drink offering. In other words, he was, he was about to die at the hands of the Romans. And the time for my departure is near. Why was it that Paul was ready to die? Verse 7 in that passage tells us, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Paul says, Lord, I can die now because I'm done. Friends, wouldn't that be wonderful that you, you're ready to die because you, you know you've done what, what Jesus wanted in your life? Listen up, Christian. I believe that a Christian can finish the work or the mission that Christ has, has given him to do. The Apostle Paul said to the, the first bishop of, of Laodicea, Colossians 4.17, and these words are the instructive, see to it that you complete the work that you have received in the Lord. See to it, Paul says, that you finish the work that you have received in the Lord. You know, Jesus gives each of us a, a mission to do. He gives us a, a work to do. And Christian, you need to finish that work. See to it that you complete the work you have received in the Lord. Will you complete the mission of, of Jesus? Will you complete the, the mission that, that Christ has, has given to you? And to you, and to you, 
and to you and to you? Will you complete the mission that, that Jesus has given to you?